I take these things off. Uh, you, you, all, you may all be seated. I am Mayor Craig Newton, and I uh, want to simply offer a formal welcome to the city of Norcross. You know, as mayor of this wonderful city, uh, I just want to take a moment to say uh, to Sec Secretary Becerra, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for coming to Norcross. Uh, we certainly appreciate your, your presence. And to all of you, uh, our special guests and visitors, we extend our warmest welcome to the city of Norcross. And I think shortly we'll be doing introductions going around the table. Now just a little bit about Norcross. We are the county's second oldest uh, city. And from its inception to, the de to today, we are one of the most uh, diverse cities in uh, not only Gwinnett County, but the entire state. As a film-ready uh, city, uh, the city of Norcross has had such notables as Oprah Winfrey and, uh, gosh, we've had Tom Hanks and Robert Redford walking our streets. Uh, and we've even had a president uh, here also. But, uh, you know, I, I have to say that I'll never forget uh, the day that our, our late congressman, John Lewis, was here on this very stage uh, speaking to my city. I will never forget that. But, you know, as a Norcross native myself, I've seen several changes and experienced several shifts, uh, but nothing like the national pandemic uh, and the world pandemic that we're facing today. Uh, the behavioral health crisis is another huge issue uh, that we face as a nation. So I'm pleased that you're all here today, and I look forward to a spirited conversation and ultimately some solid solutions addressing the health inequity uh, that we are facing in our nation and the world. So again, welcome to Norcross. Secretary. Hey, Mayor, uh, first, thank you very much. Uh, and I, I had no choice but to come to Norcross. So, uh, Congresswoman Bordeaux said, you gotta come to Norcross. So I, that's why I'm here. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that both uh, Congressman Bordeaux and, uh, and Congressman Johnson are, are taking the time to be with us. I know they've been champions for a long time for the folks in Georgia when it comes to health care. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to join them and be here with you. Uh, please convey to the people of Norcross that we thank them for making this facility available for us today and we wish you continued success. Uh, I will uh, only say a couple things because I know we want to go around the, the table and have everyone introduce themselves. Uh, one, we are looking forward to working with the people of Georgia because we know that there is a lot of real enthusiasm to continue to build for better health care that's more affordable for more of your folks. And whether it is trying to see if uh, the state will move forward with expanded Medicaid, whether it is the issue of continuing to grow the number of people who join through the Affordable Care Act, act to, to join up with the, an insurance plan. And by the way, we have until August 15 for people to enroll in the Affordable Care Act. And, and as the Congresswoman and I were chatting just a moment ago, and be able to afford these plans, great plans, where in many cases people are paying no more than $10 a month in premiums, for a great health insurance policy. Some two million Americans have so far taken up the president's offer to enroll during the special enrollment period. And we hope that people here in Georgia will take up the, the invitation as well until August 15th. But whatever route that you can access health care and health insurance, we want to be there to help. And we hope that what we can do is leave an indelible mark here in the state of Georgia that we are a good partner. So accessing health, getting vaccinated, doing all the things we need to do to get back to uh, running business and our affairs the way we are accustomed to. That's what we want to help see. So thank you very much for letting uh, me join you here. Thank you again to the people of Norcross for making themselves available to us. And let me just go around the table. Okay, well, thank you, Mayor Newton, for hosting. Thank you so much to the uh, city of Norcross. And thank you, Secretary Becerra. It's a real honor to have you here visiting with us in this community. Um, and I see so many friends around here, and we have all 
just thrown ourselves first into dealing with the COVID crisis. Um, and, but I think that this is all part of a broader set of issues around health care, health insurance, and trying to get our community covered. Um, I recently led the effort in the House to introduce the Medicaid Saves Lives Act. Uh, I co-led this with uh, Congressman Hank Johnson, as well as other members of the Georgia uh, congressional delegation. On the Senate side, Senators Warnock and Ossoff have introduced this legislation. And not only have we tried to provide incentives to the American Rescue Plan for Georgia to expand Medicaid, this is basically a workaround if Georgia decides not to do it. Um, we have a federal program that can come and expand Medicaid for us. Why is this important? Well, about 500,000 people in Georgia would be eligible for reduced price health insurance, or for free health insurance, basically, if we were to expand Medicaid. And in our community, this would have a huge impact. One of the reasons we're struggling to get people vaccinated is because people don't have access to health insurance, they don't have a doctor, they just don't have that baseline health care that so desperately need. And uh, it is also very important, even if you have health insurance, because all of us pay higher premiums uh, because we have to cover all that uncompensated care. So it is not just about the, the moral issue and you know helping people who are in need, it's also an economic issue that we really need this assistance. And so I've been hitting up the secretary about that. Uh, also, we are really benefiting from the subsidy uh, that is for the purchase of health insurance on the exchange. And one of the number one things I've heard from our community over the years is that uh, we pay extortionary rates uh, for health insurance, even when we're purchasing it on the health insurance exchange. And what happened in the American Rescue Plan was a very important uh, amount of assistance, meaning that nobody will have to pay more than 8.5% of their income uh, in health insurance premiums. And so everybody, you have until August 15th for everybody to go out there, check and see if you can get a more affordable health insurance premium on the exchange, or just sign up. Really, we should have nobody in this district without health insurance. So those are some of the issues I hope as we go around, you guys will talk about some of the challenges that we face as a community. These are very important for me to hear. It's very important for the secretary to hear so that we can take these back to Washington and start tackling these. And that's very much what I'm committed to and what I've been trying to do uh, since elected. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Congressman Hank Johnson to say a few remarks and then we'll give it to Victoria to ask me. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Bordeaux, and thank you all for being here. It's my pleasure to be here with uh, Mayor Newton, uh, Congresswoman Bordeaux, my, my friend, and also my friend Javier Latera, uh, former colleague, and now uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services under the Biden administration, which has brought in a fresh, a breath of fresh air all across the spectrum of issues that we deal with in Washington, D.C. And so to start off with the uh, American Rescue Plan, which uh, put shots in arms, money in pockets, uh, created good paying jobs, and uh, sent our children back to school safely, uh, that investment is paying off big time. There's uh, a lot of money uh, we've been talking about the uh, eviction moratorium being removed now, uh, and uh, people are kind of up in arms about that, but please understand that Congress allocated $46.5 billion in, uh, in uh, tenant, landlord-tenant relief, and of that amount, uh, it still remains to be spent about uh, $43.5 billion. That's a lot of money to be applied to a pressing need. And so with the foreclosure moratorium having been lifted, and with states and local governments now having staffed up and programmed uh, appropriately to dispense with the money, now it's a matter of getting that money out. And uh, so uh, don't panic about uh, pending uh, eviction. Uh, let's err on the side of uh, making sure that we get this money that Congress has allocated under the American Rescue Plan out. And that's going to help us quite a lot. 
And then uh, we here today to deal with uh, health equity. Uh, I mean, so important. Uh, uh, the Biden administration with the American Families Plan, which has yet to be voted on in Congress upcoming, uh, is going to provide uh, uh, assistance of family medical leave, uh, sick leave, those kinds of things that will help families deal with uh, with uh, uh, health care. And I'm proud to uh, uh, rep I'm proud to support uh, uh, Representative Bordeaux's legislation, the Medicaid Saves Lives Act, which will enable people who live in states like Georgia, which have refused to accept the federal dollars, the billions of federal dollars, to expand Medicaid. And they've done that uh, for no reason other than political reasons. But the, the fact is, people are dying because they don't have access to the healthcare system. And so we in Congress are working to pass uh, uh, Representative Bordeaux's legislation to address uh, that glaring uh, weakness, uh, which is states uh, not accepting the uh, federal money. And so with that, uh, you know, the Biden administration has ushered in a new time of, uh, uh, of uh, changed values that reflect um, emphasis on human development. And uh, thank you all for being here for what you do to uplift uh, the health of, uh, of uh, the people who you serve. So thank you, the uh, CPACs and all of the other agencies that are here and uh, all of the other elected officials here, including uh, Commissioner Watkins. Thank you so much, Congressman A. Johnson. Just want to thank Secretary uh, Bracero for taking the time to come to Congressional District 7 and to meet with our community leaders here. My name is Victoria Wynn. I serve as a senior VP at the Center for Community and Community Services, as well as our CPAC's Community Health Center. Uh, one of the locations here serving immigrants and refugees in Congressional District 7, as well as across the state of Georgia. And I also want to give thanks to Congressman Bordeaux and Mayor Newt for hosting us here. But I'm really excited about the opportunity for our community leaders who've been doing this work for quite some time, who know the community, who knows what equity looks like in terms of health what that means, what some of the recommendations are, and what are we seeing on the ground. And so we're excited to have that opportunity to share that with you, Secretary. Um, we are in Gwinnett County, one of the most diverse counties here in the state of Georgia with a growing community within the AAPI, the largest Asian American population, a growing and thriving Latinx, Latino community, as well as a growing African diaspora community. And uh, what we're noticing during COVID, our communities are pivoting. Our communities are um, still breathing, um, and our communities are looking to rebuild. And there's still a lot of work to be done around COVID vaccines, and so uh, we're grateful for um, many of the uh, leaders here who are working together very collaboratively um, to address a lot of the barriers around transportation, language access and equity, around um, access to healthcare. So I'm excited to um, be able to moderate this conversation, just pass the microphone, and we do have some staff here that will help us move the microphone. Um, but we'll go ahead and start with Dr. Arona, um, the District Health Director here at Gwinnett County. And if you don't mind just introducing yourself and just you know, sharing a few remarks um, with the Secretary, and we'll go ahead and pass the mic. Um, Yes, well, thank you, everyone, and I'm really grateful that you're here, Secretary Becerra. What an honor to have you in our midst, and um, thank you for visiting Gwinnett County. I mean, we're really pleased to have you here. I was so excited when I learned that you were, were going to be coming, and um, thank you, Victoria, of course, Mayor Newton. Um, I call him my favorite mayor. You can't tell anybody else that, but... <laughs> you did, did. <laughs> <laughs> He was one of the first uh, mayors that reached out to me early on in the pandemic. And, um, you know, I have certainly um, taken advantage of the rich relationships that have certainly come from this past year, without a doubt. Um, I am uh, Audrey Runham, District Health Director for three counties in Georgia, Gwinnett, Newton, and Rockdale County. And it's the largest district in Georgia um, with the amount of constituents that we serve. And we are very concerned with, you know, the rise in cases now, um, and also with the decreasing per day vaccines that we're giving, uh, despite our 
multiple efforts to try to increase that and provide education. But if you don't know this about Gwinnett County, we, we have um, the benefit of having rich, rich, rich relationships in this county with our elected officials, you know, state, county, even national, uh, local uh, officials, and our education system is very rich relationships with us, and now the health department, of course, too, nonprofits, our media, um, multi, multiple, multiple businesses. I mean, we just are, are really a very cohesive group of people that love this county and really want to see it prosper and are willing to jump in uh, at any state. Um, and, you know, we feel the vaccine is the best tool in our tool belt, really, to accomplish what we need to with the, with the cases, and we're not stopping. Um, we have a, a wonderful relationship with Santiago Marquez of the Latin American Association. He's just been fabulous, as has been the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce at the state level and the Gwinnett County level and other counties, too. Um, but, you know, the, that's the best thing about our country is our, our county is our rich relationships. Um, we also have a healthcare roundtable, um, which is made up of, of, of a lot of um, healthcare and, you know, FQHCs and other doctors and hospital CEOs and, you know, the health department, of course, nonprofits, coalitions, that type of thing. And we need to talk about things, not just COVID, but equity and diversity and inclusion. And so we've been meeting. Uh, since I've been director here, which is since 2019, but it's a very robust uh, group and I feel very blessed that we have that. In addition to that, we have Gwinnett Coalition, which really is um, taking a name of its own to really deep, you know, get deeper into our community and provide, um, you know, more of like a partnership Gwinnett approach to community health and the needs of our community. So anyway, I wish you could stay for days because we have a lot to show you, but I'm grateful that you spent your time and it's a pleasure being on. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Roman and right. Dr. Shaw. Well, thank you for including me in the round table. Uh, my name is Dr. Deep Shaw. I'm a primary care internal medicine physician. Uh, practicing in Gwinnett County. I was actually born and raised in Gwinnett and I'm a native Georgia, left for school and uh, have come back to call Gwinnett County and the surrounding area home. One of the greatest joys of uh, my job is I get to see patients full time still, in addition to a leadership and management role. And I think one of the lessons that we've learned uh, from COVID is that our primary care infrastructure is sorely underfunded and under-resourced. But the bright spot is that COVID can be an opportunity for us to strengthen our existing primary care structure, infrastructure and, and build a much more robust, stronger one on top of what we have. I want to thank uh, the Secretary and some of the programs that have come out of uh, COVID, particularly provided relief and some of the other initiatives. But this is just the beginning of really trying to put primary care back in the driver's seat of keeping patients healthy. The next round of, of vaccinations, and hopefully those numbers uh, go up again, whether or not we have boosters, um, a primary vaccination. What our goal is, is how do we get our existing patients to come into the office and get vaccinated? How do we bring new patients into primary care? We want everyone to have access to care, but they've got to have a doctor to receive once they get on those insurance plans. And that is what we spend a lot of our time thinking about, is how do we get patients into the right doors? We serve a lot of black and brown communities uh, in and around Gwinnett County. We are a minority-owned, predominantly female-led uh, business, like a lot of healthcare uh, clinics in and around this country. And so I think what we want to achieve in part of today's dialogue and ongoing coalition discussion is how do we use this as an opportunity to lift up primary care in our state as an example for the country that starts having an immediate impact on patients' health? And we are honored to be a part of the dialogue as one of the community primary care clinics here today. But I'm confident that our experience is representative of what just about every other primary care clinic is going through, whether it's our partner FQHCs, uh, private practice or hospital clinic, everyone is trying to achieve the same thing. And I'll just close with a quick story. 
that yes, I'm here in a suit representing leadership, but I just left another morning at Swab Clinic. And the last conversation I had was a 76-year-old retired welder, tested COVID positive on Friday, not doing particularly well. But he's not just in quarantine, he's living alone. And those are the kind of issues that we can address with a more robust infrastructure. And hopefully that's a motivation for all of us to, to really put our heads down and, and use some of the resources that are going to be coming out of the programs, American Rescue Plan and others, to, to make this a great opportunity for our neighbors. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. We're actually going to um, skip right over here, and I do apologize just for the timing, but we wanted to give an opportunity for Emily Marquise. Uh, Marquez, um, to talk about her experience as a vaccinated youth, and I want to give her a mic. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Emily Marquez, and I am a 15 year old high school student, and I'm going to Nerd Game Academy in Dayton, Georgia. Um, it's a very small Catholic private school, but most of the kids there, the younger kids, that aren't vaccinated. I'm really vaccinated. I got vaccinated in my dad's building both times. Um, and I think kids should get vaccinated because they can spend more time with their friends and family. Because Christmas this past year, I couldn't spend it. We have a tradition where we go to my grandma's house and a bunch of my dad's side of the family, we get together and stuff. And we couldn't really do that. So I think I want you to get vaccinated so we can spend more time with friends and family. And we can get back to hugging each other and also for school to get back in person and just to have a healthy environment. So. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing your story. And I know that's something that as a community, we are you know, working together um, to really get the word out there, um, to really educate families and talk to youth and their families. And I wanted to also now pass the mic to Santiago uh, Marquez, um, the Latin American Association CEO and also father of, of Emily to talk about his experience and what they're doing over at the Santiago, before you, before you may want to mention, my time is constrained. That's why we're having this paper. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and thank you again for your patience. And as yes, Secretary, you're definitely a busy man. And I know at 4 o'clock you do have a, a call that you do need to be on for the White House, with the White House. And so. Yeah, yeah. Tell them that I'll be a, a few minutes delayed. So okay. Okay. Everyone was gracious enough to come, so but we'll have to go quickly. Thank you so much, Secretary. I'll be very quick. Thank you for being here. Thank you to everybody for having us. And yes, I'm very proud to be Emily's father. She got vaccinated in our building. Dr. Rohn has been a great partner. We have been vaccinating since April. We vaccin we're vaccinating every week. Um, when we started, we were seeing like 200 people a week, maybe up to 250. Two weeks ago, we had 10 people coming. And then last Friday, we had 40 people come. We've tried all kinds of marketing, uh, not gimmicks, but different marketing strategies. We've had radio stations do live remotes. We've had giveaways. Um, we changed our marketing recently to try to equate the vaccine with you know saving your kid's life, right? We're really trying to make a push to getting kids vaccinated. But just to give you some context, we serve about 45,000 people a year. And vaccine, vaccines um, is something we had to do because of COVID, but we focus on social services, immigration, youth services, and that work continues. On the healthcare piece, yes, uh, our typical client is a single mom with two kids, no healthcare. They'll take care of their kids. They'll do everything they can to take care of their families. But when it comes to them, they put themselves last. And that lack of primary care is a big is a big issue, and we've seen it during the pandemic. I want to acknowledge Belisa Urbina and Gigi Pedraza, two of my leaders, um, heroes, sheroes, and colleagues, and they've done amazing work and continue to do amazing work. Thank you so much, Santiago. And now I'm just going to introduce uh, Dr. Stampath, who's you know um, also a medical provider in the community setting. Thank you so much. Um, I did want to, I know we're all here because we feel very passionately about health equity. Um, and I just wanted to share a story with you 
of um, an immigrant patient for whom you know, support services, social services, and enabling services were particularly important. So in our community health center, we have a patient navigator program. And the navigators are from the communities they serve, they speak the language, they know the culture well, and they understand the barriers that our patients face to receive care. Uh, in particular, we had one um, family that was a new refugee family from Myanmar. They were Burmese, um, didn't have a medical home, and the boy was constantly sick in and out of the urgent care with respiratory infections. So our navigator identified him in the community and brought him into our health center. And at that point, you know, we realized that he had on exam and on x-ray a very unusual condition where his heart and all his organs were actually on the wrong side. And this was due to a rare genetic condition that he had, which also predisposed him to infections. But it was those enabling services, having the navigator bring him in, um, that got him on the right track and allowed him to have a medical home. So to me, the story just highlights that these things work. Having enabling services and social services um, and Medicaid, if you can get it to the folks that we want to serve, they really do work. You know, a few years later now, his health is you know 100% better than compared to what it was before. And we've been doing the work here um, you know, for the past 40 years. Center for Canadian Community Services has been working with immigrants, refugees, and the underserved. Um, to get folks access. And um, we thank you for your support so far, and hope that you'll continue to support us in the future. Thank you, Dr. Stemhouse. And I know a lot of our work um, is not only just providing the medical services, but doing a lot of the advocacy work, right? Of making sure that the needs of our communities are, uh, the voices of those communities are being uplifted. So I just want to pass the mic to Mr. Nathaniel Smith um, with partnerships uh, for Southern Equity to share some uh, Mr. Secretary, it's definitely an honor and a pleasure to meet you and uh, have an opportunity to sit here with my former Congressman Hank Johnson and others who have labored so courageously for the community. Um, I really want to be short in my comments because there's so many people who have a lot of things to share, but one of the things that I want to always lift up when we're in conversations like this is that there, are, there is a reason why communities of color are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And that is because of structural racism. You know, a lot of times people don't necessarily want to elevate, they, they want to talk about health equity, but they don't want to talk about structural racism. And, and at the end of the day, when we're having conversations about health, we have to embrace the fact that structural racism is a social determinant. And that social determinant affects the communities in which these various communities of color are in and in our position, unfortunately, to be affected by COVID-19 in a disproportionate fashion. Right? So we have to begin to look at how can we begin the process of working to create communities that are healing, communities that are healthy, communities that provide opportunities for communities of color to be in a place where they can reach their full potential. And at the end of the day, that is the greatest enemy against COVID-19, healthy communities, not just the vaccine. Um, for us as an organization, we work around the state and around the Southeast, really working to advance a racial equity agenda, right? An agenda that elevates the reality that no barrier, especially skin color, should minimize the opportunity for children and other communities of color. And even though we focused a great deal on advocacy and really focused a great deal on supporting the voices of community, because of COVID-19, we were forced to actually become service providers. We actually were forced to actually raise over close to a billion dollars to support frontline organizations through our COVID-19 emergency fund to ensure that the people on the ground are actually positioned to help the community. And while it's important to have more formalized structures in place, it is the people that are closest to the problem that are actually closest to the solution, right? And we have to make sure that they have an opportunity to have a voice. And we try our best to do that through the support of our COVID-19 emergency fund. And at the same time, really work really hard to bring together not just the facts, but also, as you said before, the voices of the community so they can really be positioned to really be influential and to be heard as it relates to the process. And so, you know, my quick feedback is just you know, COVID-19 in particular, but also the other challenges that we have that are immediate, 
are providing a real opportunity for us to see what are, what are the systemic and structural challenges that we have in our communities. And while we've been very good at finding COVID-19 process, the greatest virus that we have to deal with in our communities on many cases is structural racism. How can we find a way through a health equity agenda to inoculate that problem? That is where I think we really have a chance and Mr. Secretary really move the ball in a way that's never been done before. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, and now I'd like to pass it over to uh, Dr. Jacobs uh, with the Georgia Primary Care Association to share her remarks. Hi, I'm Dr. Teresa Jacobs. I'm the medical director for the Community Health Service here in the state of Georgia. We're in over 100 counties. We service over a half million Georgia residents every single year. Uh, PEDS, uh, OBGYN, behavior health, primary care. Uh, we got it all there at community health centers. Uh, the thing that I really want to say is that, you know, almost 30 years ago when I first started, the first the heart attacks were at 70, 80 years of age. Unfortunately, because of those disparities now, uh, because of the issues with folks getting to access, unfortunately, those heart attacks guys are at 30-something. They're at 40-something now. And it just breaks my heart to see that. It really does. So, you know, expanding, uh, making sure folks uh, get uh, more insurance would be absolutely wonderful. We've got lots of success stories. Uh, we're still seeing first generation of folks graduating uh, from college, believe it or not. And we're really thankful and grateful for that. Community health centers are servicing those that are underinsured and those folks that don't have any insurance at all. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, uh, broadband is still an issue in those rural communities. Uh, if they can't do telehealth, if they don't have broadband, right? And so we, we really appreciate the fact that, you know, telehealth has been something now community health centers can actually bill for and get paid for, but expanding coverage uh, down there to those rural communities would absolutely help us to get those folks in and so that we can do primary care and do what we do best. Uh, I think I'll end it there. Uh, I absolutely love what I do. Uh, and uh, lots of doctors uh, that are here, we love what we do. Uh, but it's tough to do it when we have patients that just don't have access. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs. And I know that our time is, is, is limited. Um, do we have another, just one more remark? One more. Okay, one more remark. And so, you know, I'll pass over uh, the mic uh, to Dr. Mack, uh, the director of the National Center for Primary Care, as well as the director of the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network, uh, to share, you know, all that's happening within that network um, and how, you know, we're working towards, you know, eliminating a lot of the issues around COVID. Welcome, Secretary. Thank you for having us here today. Um, what I want to, I saw in the CPACs, they had an entry in here about we need your help talking about survey with data and of course the data and how it needs to be used. With the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network, it's been a partnership across national, state, and territories um, with those disproportionately impacted communities. And we are linking communities to COVID services, but what we're finding is with the data, a lot of communities are hidden. Um, and also, the need for comprehensive data with even the statistics around COVID is so important because we know that equips to money, health services for communities. So if they're not properly identified, we can't properly resource health services across this country. So I would like to leave you with what you already know, but we need to expand the way we capture data the way we're inclusive of all communities as we go forward. And my colleague, Dr. Jacob, spoke about technology. We know when it comes to the genomes and the genetics that it's not inclusive of all populations. That's because we're not gathering the data properly. We're not partnering with those who can reach those who are under the bridges and in the darkest parts of our community. And when I say darkest, the most remote and untouchable communities. And I'll just leave with this. One of the groups we work with is a Pacific Power Group, POL, 
And they let us know that the data that was being reported on morbidity and mortality with COVID-19 was inaccurate. The worst morbidity and mortality was happening in totally different states in which we're being reported. So they let me know that, hey, I'm African American and Pacific Islander. There are unique, there are similar problems, but there are unique problems. So we need multilingual and multicultural solutions that can fit our community. So thank you so much for having us here today. And thank you to all the guests for all of your comments and also the ethnic media here. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to you know, what's happening here in Gwinnett County in Georgia, but also some of the recommendations that we have. You heard about navigators, outreach education, the importance of F2HCs, cultural and linguistically competent services, data, collaborative approaches. And we invite you back, right? We invite you to come back and to invite us to be at the table uh, so that we continue to provide what's happening here on the ground, but also to uplift the voices of the community here in Gwinnett, as well in the state of Georgia. So thank you again, Secretary, Congressman Bordeaux, Congressman Johnson, and Mayor Newton uh, for hosting this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to Department of Health and Human Services Press, uh, Kamara Jones. So we'll have to be quick, one question, and please target them to the secretary. If you have questions for others, you can save that for the end. El Nuevo, Georgia, first question. Thank you so much. Secretario en Español, me gustaría escuchar esta, su intervención y su mensaje para la comunidad latina que tiene un bajo nivel de vacunación, no solamente en Georgia, sino a nivel nacional. Bueno, para empezar, un saludo muy cálido a todos mis queridos amigos de la comunidad latina que, que pueden escuchar o ver. Y un mensaje muy claro y muy importante. Necesitamos proteger a los que queremos más. Es para nosotros tomar ese control y no dejar que otros sufren porque nosotros no tomamos las acciones que podamos. Es tiempo de vacunarse. Es tiempo de ayudarnos a vacunar a otros. Así que por favor, en este momento cuando la vacuna no cuesta nada, el, el gobierno federal ha puesto disponible la vacuna sin costo sin costa ninguna persona en este país, no importa de dónde viene, cuál idioma habla, usted no tiene que pagar ni un centavo para esta vacuna, es tiempo que todos tomamos la responsabilidad de estar seguros que nuestros seres humanos, nuestros seres queridos, se están vacunando. I said get back to Hi, Secretary Bissetta. Um, so as COVID-19 cases rise, how could the end of the bench moratorium um, you know, affect health inequalities? Yeah, I'm sorry, the, the moratorium, are we talking about the uh, eviction moratorium? Yes, sir. So I, I suppose the question one more time. Sure, so you know, as cases continue to rise, how could the end of it um, you know, affect health inequalities? Well, as the, as the Center for Disease Control, which is located here in Atlanta, in the Atlanta area, has said, uh, there is every reason to try to do everything we can to protect our, our loved ones and our neighbors from uh, contracting COVID-19. One of the best ways to do that is to prevent people from end up in congregate housing or in public spaces because they don't have their own place to live. And so as people find themselves because of COVID-19 and the loss of a job or loss of income, unable to pay their rent, uh, oftentimes what will happen is if you, they lose their housing, they will go live with other friends or relatives, and then they bring in more people into a close setting, which during the spread of COVID becomes more dangerous. Or we might find them having to use homeless shelters where you again have a congregate setting, which could be more dangerous and cause more spread. So uh, the CDC and the federal government has done way with everything we can to try to avoid the uh, eviction of uh, Americans from their housing during this time of pandemic. Unfortunately, we have had several court cases where the courts have said that the authority uh, had, uh, of CDC to declare the moratorium has been extended beyond what the authority permits. Uh, we have challenged that in court and we have in some ways been able to fight back, but
but at this stage, the, the order allowing for the uh, moratorium expired on the 31st. We're continuing to explore ways to continue to provide Americans with the safety they need, but what I can say is that uh, we are gonna try to do all we can, as President Biden has said, to make sure that Americans are safe and we beat back this COVID pandemic. Georgia Health News. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, uh, there have been politicians as well as healthcare leaders who have wondered why the FDA doesn't give full authorization to the uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, what's your understanding of where that situation lies now? So uh, the FDA, like the CDC, a very important institution in this country that relies on the science and the facts in order to promulgate actions and rules. And thank God that we, I think, uh, I know I do, I trust when I hear the FDA and I hear the CDC, I believe it's the experts, the professionals who've studied this, looked at the science and looked at the facts, who are issuing these declarations. You need them. Because in this world that we see now with social media as well, how important it is to have trusted voices guiding us in these very serious uh, events. The FDA has said that they are exploring uh, how we can approach the vaccines. Because we were in a pandemic, they authorized the use of these vaccines on an emergency basis, which means short of the full approval process, the vaccines were made available. And here's where I have to stop for a second to give a quick note. <coughs> the emergency use authorization that was provided for these COVID-19 vaccines is short of the full process of authorization that usually a vaccine has to go through. But after more than 300 million shots have gone into arms of Americans, and with the rate of success of protection from uh, COVID-19 that these vaccines have provided, and the very minute number of cases where there have been uh, uh, difficult reactions, I think all of us can say that the facts are in front of us that show that these vaccines are not only safe, but effective. That full use authorization is under consideration. How quickly it will come? How quickly will the science let us have the answer? Uh, we go with the science. If the science moves quickly, we'll move quickly. If the science requires a little extra time, that's what we'll take. Because at the end of the day, it's that good housekeeping seal of America that you want on the declaration by the FDA. You want people to trust what the FDA says, because it's not just your life, it's the life of your family, your children. And so the FDA will move but it will be moved by the science. Georgia Public Broadcasting. Mr. Secretary, how concerned are you about the uninsured levels we might see post-pandemic, especially among communities of color, and in states where Republican officials are reluctant to use Medicaid, what do you see as a solution? Well, we should all be very concerned when you have anyone in your neighborhood, anyone in your family, who doesn't have access to a doctor or a hospital, not only is it economic insecurity, but it is total loss of peace of mind. Uh, the stories of parents who have avoided sending their child to a hospital because they were afraid they wouldn't be able to pay the mortgage or rent, it, it, it's, it's a tragedy. And so we should all be concerned. We know that there are millions of Americans today who don't have access to good quality health care because they don't have insurance. We also know that there are about uh, 4 million Americans who could have access to health insurance through Medicaid, through the expansion of Medicaid, who haven't gotten it because there are 12 states in America that have not expanded their uh, access to Medicaid for their people. Here in Georgia, there are several hundred thousand Georgians who could have health insurance coverage and that peace of mind if they could gain access to the Medicaid expansion program. We're working with the state of Georgia right now on whether or not uh, or how they will expand uh, Medicaid. And we hope that there's a good solution. We also know that the senators and members of Congress uh, representing Georgia, as you've heard earlier from Congresswoman Bordeaux and Congressman Johnson, are working on legislation to get Georgia there. One way or the other, it is critical to give Americans and Georgians 
Not just health insurance, but peace of mind. KTN? Uh, you have a question? Uh, Job Korea News, last question. Any questions? All right, all right, we're good. Thank you. Thank you all very much, and thank you to everyone who took the time to be here. Victoria, thank you for uh, moderating this. Hey, Ruth, thank you so much. Congresswoman Bordeaux, Congressman Johnson, as always, pleasure to see you. Keep the good work going. Thank you all very much.